I believe we could go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, Representative Mead, for joining us today um, during Children's Advocacy Week. We're excited to have you. Um, before we go ahead and kick it off, I'm just going to have Hunter kind of introduce you and also um, introduce himself. So Hunter, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Hunter Fackler. I'm a Face It Youth Ambassador with Cozares Charities Face It Movement to End Child Abuse. As an advocate, I'm excited to hear from our legislators today. I'm excited to introduce two Kentucky legislators who are champions for youth across the Commonwealth as they continue to address issues related to the child welfare system and needs of youth throughout Kentucky. I'm honored to introduce Senator Julie Rocky Adams, who represents the 36th District, which is part of Jefferson County. Senator Adams has shown her leadership and commitment as Majority Caucus Chair and Co-Chair of the Children of the Child Welfare Oversight Committee. I'm also honored to introduce Representative David Mead, who represents the 80th District, which includes Pulaski and Lincoln counties. Representative Mead's commitment and leadership can best be seen in his work as the Speaker Pro Tempor, as well as Co-Chair of the Child Welfare Oversight Committee alongside Senator Adams. And then I'll hand it right back to Mahek. Thanks, Hunter. And thank you, Representative Mead and Senator Julie Rocky Adams for joining us today. I'm kind of going to go ahead and dive into questions. I know you guys have limited time and I want you guys to have all the time in the world to, to talk. Um, so just wanted to say many of our partners and advocates and young adults who are joining us today, this might be their first interaction with you. Um, and in order for them to get to know you better, I just wanted to start by asking you both. Who are your influences? And either one could, could kind of jump off and take it from there. Um, I'll go first. What is it? Age before beauty. Um, David, is that how they say it? And uh, okay, so <laughs> I guess <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, okay, so some of my biggest influence uh, is in my life. It, clearly it would have to be my mom and dad. Um, you know, I am, um, I was raised by two human beings that uh, taught me, they taught me two things. They said, there's two things in this world that no one can ever take away from you. And that is your education. And the second one is your faith in God. And so they said that kind of how they raised all of us was, we're going to do the best we can to give you the best education possible, because that will equip you to take care of yourself. And then we're going to give you this foundation of faith that will carry you through so many ups and downs that you will experience in your life. And so, you know, those two things I've kind of, you know, developed in my own, uh, in my own family and how I've tried to raise my kids. Um, so that I think my parents are just, I, I just hit the lottery of, uh, with parents. And then, um, you know, the other thing too, along my journey, of um, getting to this point, you know, I've had some really fabulous teachers. Um, I tell people all the time, sometimes my most fabulous teachers were my most liberal teachers because they made me think outside of kind of my traditional box of, um, of how I was raised. And so they, they've been a good influence on me. And then lastly, in this political arena, you know, they say, if you ever want a friend, you need to get a dog because everybody's really mean and no one really um, is your friend. But I have been blessed um, to have some really good mentors in the political world. And um, I worked for Congresswoman Ann Northup, who was fantastic. She was a mom, um, she had six kids. And um, you know, she taught me a lot about how, how to be a working mom, um, how to take criticism, um, how to bounce back from adversity. Uh, and also I work for Senator Mitch McConnell, who, you know, most people think as a woman that I would have a fee, uh, only female mentors. But the truth is, you know, you need to seek out mentors whenever you can find them. And he just happened to be a great male mentor to me. And, um, and uh, there's no one who has been more encouraging of me running for office and trying to help than, than Senator McConnell. So, so I've had some I've had some luck in my life and I'm just very grateful. And so, and plus I love being here. I love KYA and I love Children's Advocacy Week. And so I'm happy, happy, happy to be on this Zoom. Well, for me, I think that uh, I, I grew up in a very large family. 
up until I was about 12 or 13 years old, I had actually nine grandparents still alive, uh, whether it was grandparents or great grandparents. Uh, and my, my great grandmother died when I was 12. And since then, of course, life has taken its toll. And now I have one grandparent remaining. But out of, out of all those folks, I think uh, for me, my primary uh, influences were, of course, my mom and dad. My mom is one of the kindest, gentlest people you'll ever meet in your life. She taught me that kindness and compassion are two of the greatest attributes that a leader can have. And my father's always taught me that hard work and, and, and dedication and honesty are the best ways to live a life. And he's always taught me that you're, he's one of those people that believes that your word is all you have and that when you give somebody that, you make sure you follow through with it. But uh, also for me, my great grandmother, who was, uh, she passed away about eight years ago, actually. I was about 36 years old when she passed away. So I was blessed to have her for a long time in my life. But her and my grandmother probably taught me what it meant to live life as an example of a Christian person uh, more than anybody. And so uh, those would be my primary influences. Of course, my wife is a, is a wonderful faith-filled woman. She's a youth pastor at our church. I'm the youth, I'm the uh, music minister at our church. And so that's always had a, a profound place in my life. And so those are some of my influences. My daughter, of course, is adopted uh, from Korea. And she is the reason that I have so much passion for, for many of these uh, policies and issues that we, we try to push forward. Well, thank you both. Um, we often say those that um, we are surrounded by, interact with is who, we, who shapes us. So certainly it's great to hear um, from you both around who influences you. So now we get into the fun stuff around policy conversations. Um, we know that this session has kicked off in a fast paced environment. Um, and there's many issues that both of your chambers will tackle during the 60 day session. Um, what are you looking forward to or anticipating to, ta to tackle this session? I can take this one first since Julie got the last one. Uh, of course, this being our budget year, that's going to be our top priority. And you saw us release that last week, and it had a lot of our priorities in that. Uh, but also this year, I'm looking forward to hopefully moving on down the road with tax modernization. We took that first step in 2018, and that first step is always the hardest. So uh, we're looking to continue that this year uh, since we had a couple of years delay there with the, the pandemic. Uh, and then also, I'm, I'm continuing to work on public assistance reform with the speaker. And we want to try to move that forward. Uh, we want to do that in a in a compassionate way, uh, but uh, also a way that holds people accountable. Uh, so those are those are the primary things that we're looking forward to, and uh, that's probably what you're going to see us tackle the most on this side. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll agree with David. You know, the budget is you know really uh, it's the most important thing that we can do this session. And I've always said. You know, I think the most compassionate thing that you can do is to create an environment where someone can have a job and they're able to have that worth and that value and they're able to care for their families. And so when he's talking, you know, sometimes tax modernization and tax reform doesn't sound too sexy, but it really is so basic because it allows that environment for us to grow jobs and then therefore grow opportunities and then um, make that connection of, of that self-worth and value. So I'm with David on, you know, really making sure that we put together a strong budget. Um, you know, just right before I, I jumped on this Zoom, I presented the um, essential caregivers bill in front of health and welfare. We passed it in, out of committee today. And, um, you know, that's something that I wasn't planning on doing, but we didn't kind of reauthorize that um, that had been uh, previously voted on before with some of the governor's emergency orders and in the uh, subsequent special session reauthorization for the uh, for caregivers. And all this is, is it allows um, your family members, your loved ones to be able to enter into a nursing home or a state run mental health facility so that you can have that human connection and that, you know, a pandemic or, um, you know, it is not a barrier for us to make that human connection with our loved ones. And um, hopefully I don't expect any, um, there to be much opposition because, you know, everybody House and Senate has already voted for it before. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed on that one. Um, another one that, you know, I've been working on and I'm going to um, 
I'm going to introduce this week, hopefully tomorrow, is, you know, kind of that um, the holistic approach to child welfare. We're looking at um, um, pretty heavily on the prevention side of things. Um, we're also looking at some of the reorg components with DCBS and our social workers. Um, this will uh, this will have a price tag attached to it because um, it's important that uh, we finally put our money where our mouth is that, you know, I don't want to be number one in uh, child abuse and neglect anymore. And so um, there's some kind of big ideas in this. There's some smaller ideas in this, but um, I think it's a great jumping off point. I know we've reached out to KYA for their input. We've reached out to the child advocacy centers and and a lot of the stakeholders to try to put together what I think is you know, a really solid piece that will help move um, the future of our kids into a better position than they currently are. Um, it's, it's time we start to help those people who are trying to help kids. And so it's it's a partnership. And um, so, so look for that tomorrow, hopefully. We'll be a rollout tomorrow. Thanks for that sneak peek, Senator Adams. Um, and, and I'm going to get to tax reform and public assistance in a minute, uh, Representative Mead. But I, I wanted to ask you both. We know that the budget is, you know, a, a value document. Um, it's a priority document. It, it's also something that kids and families need, you know, for, for the state to move forward. And there's a million, over a million counting on them um, right now. Uh, what kid-related items can we expect uh, moving forward within the budget? Well, uh, oh, you go. <laughs> well, we we rolled out, of course, our our version of the budget last week. And if you ever follow this process, this is a long process. It's going to go over to the Senate. The Senate's going to have their own thoughts, ideas, and priorities that they're going to put into it, and then we're going to come together to to merge that and make the best policy that we possibly can for the state. But what what you saw last week in our budget is that we are going to continue to fund Kentucky's K through 12 programs at historic highs. We, we, we started that in 2018. That's the first budget that we were able to write as a majority in the house. And we funded that, we started that funding then. This year, you're gonna see for people funding the highest lava that it's ever been, uh, also in real dollars. Uh, this year, we, we proposed $4,100 to seek, $4,200 for next year. That's up from uh, about $4,000. And the thing about that is for every single dollar that is spent on SEEK, uh, you will see about an $800,000 increase in the budget. So uh, we are, we're going to do all we can to help fund that. We're also going to raise uh, what we've been paying in uh, kindergarten uh, from half day to all day kindergarten. Also, uh, we've been funding 51% transportation for years. We're raising that to about 70% in most areas, and some are even getting 100% funding. What that's going to do is free up money for those schools to be able to put that directly into the classroom and work on the education of our children, uh, especially when it comes to early education, uh, where we really know that we have, have had a loss in the past year through this pandemic. So we're going to try to make sure that we fund that appropriately. Uh, you're also going to see us give family resource centers additional money, about $12 million, because we know uh, how important they are to our families and our communities uh, across the state. And uh, you're also going to see us take this one-time money that is being offered by the federal government, and we're going to plan for it responsibly. We're not going to put it into things that are going to be recurring expenses. We're going to use that where we can, and uh, we're going to be very responsible and good stewards of the money that's been given to us by the taxpayers. Yeah, and I think, you know, David had a really comprehensive list, and that's really good. And, you know, the House has done a lot more thinking on their budget than the Senate has. I, I guess, are you all sending it over to us this week? Is that what you said? Uh, next we are, we're still in discussions on it, but we're going to try to get it over as quick as possible uh, and give us more time than we've had in the past to be able to yeah. move this process forward. Yeah, so we're... Um, so we're looking forward to getting that. You know, it's it's interesting because as soon as the House released their budget, you know, you start to get all these phone calls and people are like, is this in it? Is this in it? Is and um and it's it's interesting, at least from the phone calls I've gotten, is that there are so many people who agree with so many of these educational components that agree with so many of these um components that touch our kids. And um, so I think that the Senate will have a nice 
nice um, uh, solid framework to look at. And, you know, if we need to tweak it, we need to tweak it. But um, I, I think you all should be really proud of that work because it's, it's a good product. You know, one of the things that I'll just add to his list that I know that we've had conversations on on our side is the whole child care component to workforce development. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're talking about capturing that population that really needs that, um, that CCAP investment, that, um, that raise in reimbursements. Um, we need to tackle that issue of um, child care deserts, and, you know, and um, you know, changing planning and zoning, or how, how do we how do we identify those deserts? And um, and then also, there's talk of an incentive for larger businesses um, to create child care centers if they're over a certain threshold of um, employees. And um, because you know it, it's it, it's cost prohibitive so a lot of these employers and so how do we work with them how do we become a partner with them to um, allow for them to provide that benefit because um, I know even though my kids are grown I would rather work for an employer who took the time to do that than one who didn't you know you would just think altruistically that, that that's where that's where I want to go that's where I want to work for that they care enough about that issue. Um, so anyways, I, I think we really need to solve this child care issue if we're going to solve our workforce issue and, um, and, and move forward. Certainly. I think you and nailed that right there. I was going to say, we know that access to high quality, reliable ch child care allows parents to, to get a job and keep a job. Um, and it sets children up for success in schools and strengthens the Kentucky economy. And, you know, and I just want to say one more thing on that, because, you know, sometimes we entertain bills that talk about, you know, really strengthening that child care component. Let's put some more measurements on it. Let's put some more red tape on it. And then we have members who say, oh, my gosh, you're you're making it so difficult. We don't even have any child care. Like there are counties that don't even have child care. And here we're shoring all of it up and putting more barriers to entry into it. And they're like, just give us some child care. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, when we talk about deserts, they're, they're real things. Senator, I hope you bring that passion to the, to the, to the budget conversations as we move forward. <laughs> and, I, and I know a lot of advocates joining this call are counting on you to do so. So I appreciate that. Um, so just moving forward and looking ahead as well, you know, what kid or family supports related policy issues will we be championing this session? I know we've heard tax reform and public assistance um, and some of your bills, Senator Adams, but um, Representative Mead, I don't know if you want to talk about your public assistance bill that you're looking into. This, this seems like a perfect time to do so. Yeah, we've been working on that for uh, speaker and I've worked on it now the past three sessions and uh, we are, as I said, we want to do it in a compassionate way that, that is helpful. Uh, one of the things we want to do in it is try to create a bridge insurance program for those who are, are, are wanting to get back out of the workforce, but they're afraid of taking a job because of losing health care. That shouldn't be an issue for folks. We should make sure that we, we can help them in that, in that area. So what we're wanting to do is develop a bridge insurance program that will uh, stair step them off of it instead of reaching that cliff and just losing it immediately. Uh, we want to do this. We want to increase the child care assistance um, uh, in the same way. Uh, I know there's programs out there for that, but we want to enhance those to also provide more assistance with the child uh, child care. Um, also, you we're going to, uh, like, as I said, hold folks accountable. I mean, there are folks out there that misuse the system, and when they misuse the system, that takes away from folks who really need the public assistance that's being offered. And so we, we've got some measures in there to try to capture that as well. Um, but you're also gonna see the house side, uh, we're gonna have a focus on safety and, and mental health resources as well this year. We've already passed a couple of those bills. We've got some more that are gonna be coming. Uh, you know, the Surgeon General announced that ER visits for suicide attempts in girls rose last year, 50% uh, in 2021, over 2019. And for boys, they rose 4%. So we, we have to do more in that area. And that's one of our primary focuses this year. But everything that we do in this budget is 
is to protect our youth. We're going to provide pilot programs to offer mental health services in rural communities through uh, the mobile crisis service expansions. Uh, we're providing uh, certified speech pathologists and all audiologists with subsidy pay, just like certified teachers to help in those areas. We're raising the salary uh, and retention payments for social workers. We're also adding 100 social worker slots this year, 100 more next year for a total of 200. Uh, so we are, we're doing everything we can to try to make the lives of children across the state better. But we also believe that uh, the policies that we make on the economic side, as Julie mentioned earlier, is benefiting families. When we create an environment that brings businesses here to create jobs uh, and, and better paying jobs, people are going to provide for their families better. And so those are some of our primary focuses. Uh, one other thing that I am looking into that I'm in discussion for right, about right now um, is what we call reverse adoptions. And that is some states right now are doing a program where if a child has been in the foster care system and term, the rights have been terminated on their parents, if those parents later on in life get themselves together and are, are back on the right track, those children that have not been adopted still in the foster care system can petition to have those rights brought back and possibly bring the families back together. So that's something I'm looking at right now. I don't know we're going to be doing it, but uh, it's something I'm looking into and researching right now. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea, David. Um, I hope you do explore. I'll help you with that any way I can. People keep coming in my door, and I'm like, I'm on a Zoom. Um, but uh, also, you know, there's some. I think there's some criminal justice issues around kids that we're um, that we need to start having that conversation and start tackling too. You know all of the things that we talk about always have a price tag attached to them. And that's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, and, and I think that the house, from what I understand their budget document, you know, has really tackled some of those that, um, that have those price tags attached to them and they're paying attention to them. But I think we're going to have to look at some criminal justice. Um, I think, you know, to that point is, are there, kind of diversion options that are appropriate so that we're not going to incarcerate these people who have some low level offenses and could have more of a diversion or uh, in a recovery type program or addiction type program, um, you know, life skills type of thing where you can keep these, keep these families together, not separate them and put them into the foster care system because of something that maybe programmatic wise we could help them with. Um, and so I'm, as you know, I'm kind of passionate about those things. How do we, um, how do we fix the broken family rather than tear the family, the broken family apart? Um, and so that's why everybody who's on this call, I reach out to you all. If you've, if you've got some magic that you can share with me, I am open to listening to your magic because um we really, we need to take that approach. And I would echo those sentiments. I think both of you all have been great champions of just um, taking calls, emails, um, texts, even um, whenever they, any issues arise. Um, so I just want to say thank you to both of you all for, for being that transparent and open to all of our partners and especially to KYA um, when issues do arise and if we have ideas. Um, and also, I just wanted to point out that um, Senator Adams, you just brought up a blueprint for Kentucky's children's policy agenda policy um, around using community-based sentencing alternatives that promote you know, rehabilitation, accountability, especially if um, a person is a primary caregiver. So I appreciate you lifting up yeah. one of our blueprint policies um, today. So um, I am actually gonna turn it over to Hunter here uh, to ask one of the final questions. Thank you both and I appreciate your leadership and time. Thank you. Um, so what will you be doing, what will be different for kids and their families at the end of this legislative session? Well, I hopefully that um, my child welfare bill will pass and that we will see um, an emphasis on um, hopefully retain, attracting and retaining more social workers, hopefully, um, you know, redoing how we look at things 
from a from a crisis standpoint so that they can manage that a little bit better? Is it a high risk? Is it a low risk? How do we involve ourselves in this family that you know needs some assistance? Um, and then on the prevention side, hopefully we will have some funding. Hopefully we will have some definitional changes. We will have some board changes. We will have a few things like that that helps those those partners in our community that are at the absolute grassroots level um, and we can support them and so um, they can do their jobs better hopefully we're, we're going to make some medicaid changes so that we start reimbursing things better because that's the that's the, one of the biggest outcries from the um from the nonprofit community is we do all of these things and we just can't keep raising private dollars to take care of things that should be funded from the government side of things. And I agree wholeheartedly. So hopefully we're going to see, you know, at least on, on that end of things, I'm just very optimistic that, uh, that let's really dig in and let's, let's help Kentucky kids. I'm tired of being number one in child abuse and neglect. Uh, for me, I think I'm, um... I'm most excited about the education funding and the budget uh, and what we're, we're going to be able to do for kids in the school system. Um, I'm also excited about prevention services. It's been a passion of mine for a long time. Julie and I actually got to work together last budget cycle and put $20 million in uh, for prevention services. Uh, we want to make sure that we're continuing to spend that money in appropriate ways and that we are going to expand on the programs that are working. Uh, I, I have I have heard some things that are a little concerning about how that money is being spent right now uh, over at the cabinet. So I think we're going to look into that and try to make sure that we are being good stewards of that. Uh, but also, as, as we mentioned before, the economic policies that we are going to pass this session and work on as we go through this session uh, to create a better atmosphere uh, in, in, in the state to do business and to bring jobs. Because as we both say, it, it's the best way for folks to put food on the table and make a living for their families. And if we, most of us who serve in this job, we do it because it is true service and, and we love this state. And what we wanna do is make Kentucky the best place to live, work and, and raise a family. And that's, that's our primary goal. Amen. I think that was a great way to end um, today's legislator q and I appreciate, like I said, I appreciate both of you all for joining. Um, I know you have quite the busy schedule, so we appreciate it. And I know there's a couple of questions in the chat and we'll certainly send those to your office because I know you guys have to scoot out of here. Um, again, thank you for being awesome children's for kids. Um, and we look forward to connecting. <laughs>